Good morning and welcome to this week's episode of the Sports Curious Podcast, where we are diving in and talking about everyone's favorite tennis tournament. That's right. Break out your PIMS cup and your spot of tea. We're talking about Wimbledon. Scott, thank you for joining me today. We have our co-founder, our my co-host here to join me to talk about the tennis tournament of all time. Scott, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Excited to talk to you today about the greatest tennis tournament on grass. Wimbledon. I feel like we really missed an opportunity to not have, there's a lot of strawberries and champagne served at Wimbledon. There's a lot of PIMS that happens there. I feel like we really missed the opportunity to not morning drink here right now. And we can change that pretty easily. <laughs> Come yeah. with us to the liquor store. Grab some PIMS and get some strawberries. And Do you more. have PIMS lying around though, is what I need to understand. I was not prepared. I do not have friends. <laughs> me, me neither. It's not something I have fresh in my liquor cabinet. I Champagne, mean. yes. Champagne, yes. Liquor, no. Now, I want to start us off. Obviously, there's so many great facets to Wimbledon. And, you know, the, we cover it, the Sports Curious, the last night's game way, where we want to talk about what's happening around the tournament, not necessarily always what's happening on the court, because the box score, all those things are not what we have conversations about. And here's what the thing I'm most curious about when we when I, we started thinking about this podcast. It's right around the Olympics, like right before the Olympics start. So how does that work with tennis players? That's unique this year. The Olympics is having it will is having a huge impact actually on the Olympics and who's going to be competing in the Olympics. Um, as the tennis season goes, it usually goes clay course, which would be the French Open. And then once that ends, tires switch and start playing on grass to prepare for Wimbledon. So this year with the Olympics in France, we want to be playing on the clay courts of Roland Garros where the French Open is played. So oh, interesting. Been, so that's impacting a lot of players' preparation and who's actually going to be playing in the Olympics. That's interesting because they just, I mean, they just played the French Open was what, two or three weeks ago? Yes. Yes. And Interesting. So the players prepare their bodies differently for clay as opposed to grass. So going clay, grass, and then back to clay has actually had a lot of top players opt to not play the Olympics. Interesting. Okay, but you did tell me that Rafael Nadal is playing in the Olympics. So talk to me about that because that's cool. Yes, Nadal's career is kind of getting gone off the tracks due to injuries. Uh, we saw him in the French Open this year. It looks like he's going to be playing very limited, but he has committed to play in the Olympics since they are on clay, which is his favorite uh, surface. And he's actually playing doubles with Carlos Alcaraz, who's at number two in the world right now. And he's kind of the next young Spanish superstar. He's the next adult. He's filling the shoes, yes. So those two playing doubles together would be pretty, pretty amazing to see. You you would hope that they they would sync up and they'll play really well because sometimes when you have two phenomenal players, it doesn't always equal a championship, right? When you think about some of the teams that are put on a put on a field or on a court, so hopefully for them, the two of them have the the pride of country and will play well together. That'd be really cool to see. Absolutely, yeah. I think it will definitely put on a show. That is incredible. And Nadal did, did not play in the French Open, right? He did. Oh, he did? Okay. Yeah, he did. It just didn't go very well. Got it. Because he was un because he was unseated based on injuries, he ended up playing number four player in the world in the first round. Oh, so I'll do it. It's, yeah, that's a tough draw to have. So, yeah, I wonder I'm in. Okay, okay. So one of the cool things that I always think about when it comes to Wimbledon is the attire, mm -hmm. right? Wimbledon is one of those, the players have a requirement, they have to wear white, except the ladies can wear uh, undershorts, if you will, or bloomers or whatever you want to call them under their, their, their skirts that can be dark, Yes, which is reasonably new. They were very, very adamant about white for so long. And, um, but so players have to wear white. The crowd is always dressed impeccably. We've, we've seen Kate Middleton there. We've seen the Beckhams there. They're always dressed impeccably. I believe Lewis Hamilton, the F1 driver was sent away for not being dressed well for the Royal box. So the Royal box is just like it sounds. It, right. you know, you're going to see Kate and William and probably not Harry there. And 
I'm okay. I have health issues. Do we know is, mm-hmm. is she back in public? I'm not quite up to speed you're on. You're not on your you're not on your royal royal gossip. No, she was at the Trooping of the Colors, which was like a week and a half ago. Okay. And so she was there for that. I know she's previously been present to give the awards. I know for sure on the women's side. I I, I can't remember if she's done the men's side too, but uh, I know she's previously been there. So we'll we'll see how. I haven't seen anything that she'll be there, so I also haven't seen anything that says she won't be there. So, okay. yeah, and if anyone's sitting near her in the royal box, they'll have to wear what suit jackets, and the dress code is smart. It's smart, right? Absolutely. And I, I love, and I love because it's you know a very, very British tradition to wear hats. Mm-hmm. You are asked to not wear a hat because obviously this is a spectator sport, and people don't want to have a giant fascinator or hat in front of them. It's not, or sit next to them. It's not the Kentucky Derby. No. <laughs> no yes. So kind of in the other tradition that I truly love about the um of Wimbledon is Rufus the Hawk. Let's talk about Rufus the Hawk. I think this is one of the best conversations to ever about the entire tournament. Mm-hmm. Rufus is the uh pigeon preventing hawk that flies the grounds of Wimbledon during the tournament before it opens in the morning and at night to prevent pigeons and other birds attacking unsuspecting tennis goers with their white clothing. Eating eating your, your strawberries and creams. Yeah. Eating your strawberries and cream, maybe take a sip of your pins. You don't have to worry about that. Now, you mentioned, and I, I don't recall this, so you mentioned there were some issues with birds on the court at the French Open. Yes, they had quite a few like stoppages of play because pigeons found their way on the court. You know, I think they landed on the net, and they obviously, if you're hitting a tennis ball 125 miles an hour, if you hit a pigeon, that probably not does good. not stand a chance. No, so that's where uh, Rufus he plays. It he might be the most important aspect of this tournament. It's it's really interesting. We were in, in, during spring break. We went to we were in Phoenix, and there was a breakfast outside and there was a guy standing there with a falcon Mm -hmm. and sometimes you know places they'll do like falconry displays or something about cool these cool things that these birds can do and the guy is standing there with this falcon it has its eyes covered um they cover them when they when they're and so i'm like oh what are you are you doing a falconry display he said no this guy's here this guy's basically the rufus okay of the hotel we were staying at that he monitors and does a fly around when the pigeon, if the pigeons start to come out to get and get the breakfast from the guest. So that's what that. So I was like, okay, apparently we've we've adopted this from Wimbledon now. So smart. Rufus is now famous, super famous. Yeah, Rufus is a trendsetter. But what I, I read your notes and I did not know that Rufus, who when he was sixteen years old, sixteen weeks old, he went missing. Yeah, yeah for for a few days. Off doing whatever Rufus is do. And then he came back a few days later, and ever since, he's been performing his duties as he should. He got out of his system. He went to college. It's yeah. fine. You know, <laughs> maybe spring break. We're not it, it, was, it was spring break. Yeah. Summer break. So speaking of, I guess, we'll go hawks. We'll, we'll stick with birds. Mm-hmm. They have a challenge system at Wimbledon, which is kind of unique, right? They do. It's called Hawkeye. Not necessarily an ode to Rufus, but it's the challenge system on calls because Wimbledon still uses people as line judges. Um, some tournaments use automatic line system to take a lot of the error, human error out of it. But um, Hawkeye is the challenge system used to make sure calls get made correctly. So I'm guessing it's just a camera system set up to monitor all the lines. For replay. Yes. And um, so if a player thinks a ball might have been in or out, they can challenge. You'll hear the cloud, like a slow clap. Uh, Hawkeye reviews the call and then they'll put it up on the board in or out. Interesting. Do, and you may not know this, but do they get a limited number of challenges per match? No, they do get an unlimited opportunity to challenge. However, uh, like once I think once they get three incorrect challenges, the player can't challenge until the next set. Okay. You can't just sit there and challenge every call right. if you're losing. We've got things to do. Yes. Yeah. Well, and it, 
and that kind of goes into right i mean the thing that we we probably don't think about I mean, from a organization side is these matches are back to back to back to back so i know the main court has a roof but what do they do i mean we're in england right like there it's july in england like it rains so, how does that all work? And are we sending people to the wee hours of the morning like some of the tournaments do? How does that all work? I was looking at the stats. I don't know. Somebody gave like a 90, it was like a 90% um, rain rate during Wimbledon. I think it is raining season. Yep. Two courts do have roofs. Court one and center court. So center court is the main court where you're like in the ceiling. The matches on TV where the championships are played. So those matches aren't disrupted because they have retractable roofs. Like all the other courts are outside. So, I mean, it's kind of just at the mercy of Mother Nature at that point. And do they have, I know like the U.S. Open has time limits because it's in a neighborhood. Do, do, do you know if they have time limits or they just can they play till it's done? I don't know the exact time. I, I know there is a limit. I think because Wimbledon's kind of in the same situation with residents around, I believe. So I don't know the exact time, but they do as many matches as they can. Right, because they had some issues at Fr the French Open. I think it was uh, Novak who had a match that went to like 2 or 3 a.m. Yes. So hopefully we don't have to worry about that. And I think that potentially leads to injuries and players not right. doing well. So we saw a lot of a lot of them here today, probably get injured or not play as well as they should have based on how late they're playing. Right. Well, you know, if you want, we we don't have many of the old guard left of the Nadal's, the Novak's left. So the um, Federer. So like, if you want them to play well, maybe don't make them play till 3 a.m. It's probably way past their bedtime. Let the young kids play till 3. Yeah. Let, let's send Carlos Alcaraz out. He's like 22 years old. So, so speaking of, who are we looking at? Who should we be watching if we're, uh, we're watching Wimbledon? Who are some of the players we should be expecting to, to, to keep an eye on? And there's a lot of excitement around both men's and women's this year. A lot of, well, like you said, kind of the, the big three are kind of on, two of the big three are out in Federer and Nadal. Um, Djokovic is recovering from a knee injury that he suffered back in the French Open. Had surgery on his meniscus. He's pushing to play, is what they're saying. So It's like a three and a half week recovery it's pretty tough. Maybe, maybe a month yeah pretty tough turnaround um I, there's an american player taylor fritz who had the same exact injury who came back to play wimbledon maybe a few years ago so i think nadal's been talking to him just i mean joe has been talking to him to see kind of how it went so joe interesting the ultimate competitor so i'm sure he's going to do everything he can to get back out there to figure it out Interesting. And we obviously, we've, we've talked a little bit about Carlos Alcaraz, who has had mm -hmm. um, a great season, but he could become the youngest man to win a Grand Slam title. So there's four Grand Slams, or you can call him like a major, four Grand Slams across all three surfaces. And so he was looking to become the youngest man to win Grand Slam titles across all three surfaces, already, which he, I think is pretty cool. Yeah, sure he has. He did. Okay, sorry. The French Open was... Because oh, he won the French Open. Yeah, you're right. Um, you're right. There's three services for the majors. There's the hard courts, which are Australian and U.S. Open. And then French Open's clay and Wimbledon's grass. Wimbledon's grass. So to win across all three is incredibly hard. And he's already done it at his young age. So it's pretty remarkable. And then we have Yannick Sinner, who is now ranked number one in the world. Yes. After Novak went out during the French Open. And we've talked about him before, but his fan base uh, are the Corota boys. I believe I were saying that right. Yes. But uh, they dress like carrots because Yannick has once eaten a carrot after a match, and now they all dress like carrots. It's a phenomenal uh, following, if you will. So you won't miss his fans. I'm not sure are you allowed to wear carrot costumes in Wimbledon. I feel like that would be a, a no. I believe you. I believe you can. I don't know that a carrot would be welcome in the royal box unless. Can you put a suit coat over it? A... You could put a tie on your carrot, right? You wear a suit coat as well. Yeah. So maybe... In a top hat? I mean, I don't know. Yeah, why not? I don't think there's any... I didn't see any underlying bylaws that say no carrot suits. It just, <laughs> it just has a tie and jacket, so... That's a classy carrot. A, cl a classy carrot, as, yes. as you would expect. And then on the women's side, Iga Swiatek, who is also number one ranked in the world... She's never won Wimbledon. She's won the French Open. She's won the U.S. Open. 
but she's never won Wimbledon. Yes, this is not her best surface. To play on the grass doesn't necessarily fit her playing style, like the hard court and the clay. And that's what makes what Carlos has done so impressive, that he's able to master all three. So yeah. the women's side is pretty much wide open, I would say. Just based on Iga's not necessarily the best on grass. Maybe this is her year. But um, I want to say there's been a different women's champion at Wimbledon for many consecutive years, maybe since, I want to say Serena. I could be very wrong. Interesting. I need to look up, because Venus Williams set a record last year for the most, what's what I'm looking for? She, yeah. She's she played in the most Wimbledon. Yes. And so I wonder if she's playing again this year. Oh, we'll have to wait and say, I don't know if she's completely healthy to play. Okay. If she is, she, she's going to play. She said she'll play as long as she can. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say last year, an unseated woman won Wimbledon, which is pretty remarkable to think about. That would be like a, a 16 seed winning March Madness, something like that. That's so, incredible. That's... that's pretty wide open as to where. The men's is very flat heavy. Well, the surface is a game changer, right? Yes, absolutely. If you get someone who just specializes in the grass, you can go pretty long, make a pretty long run into the tournament. Now, I have a. Did you know? Oh. So Please do. we obviously we're playing we're playing tennis. Obviously, there are fifty three thousand ish tennis balls used during this two week tournament. Mm -hmm. But do you know why tennis balls they used to be white or black, but not yellow? Do you know why they're yellow now? Um, somebody's brother paid somebody off. That, that actually seems quite quite logical. No, they changed them yellow to be seen easier to see on TV. And so Wimbledon was a late adopter of that color change right around the 80s. Okay. Um, so hockey, please take note that it's yellow so people can see it. Just just saying hockey. I can't follow the puck half the time. The yellow hockey puck. Could you imagine how much easier that would be? Or like bright orange? Much nicer, actually. If Wimbledon I mean, adopt it, hockey can adopt, adopt it. That's... That's true. I mean, Wimbledon is way more uptight than hockey, so. Absolutely. Is there anything that you want to leave us with as we wrap up Wimbledon this year, which will start on July 1st? I'm going to make one slight correction real quick. There's 11 p.m. curfew at Wimbledon. Okay, so 11 p.m. Okay. That, yeah, so I'll we'll, we'll go back one after the until 3 a.m. Oh, that's nice. Uh, actually, maybe other than that, I want to just discuss the prize money. For this okay. It's jumped dramatically based on ticket demand. So, like, the, the amount of money these people are making is pretty incredible. And it's, if I remember, it, the purse is equal, right? Yes. All, all the tennis tournaments are equal for men and women, which is great to see. So, that's fantastic. Winner, winners of the tournament get 3.45 million, which is a 14.9% increase from last year. That's, that's incredible. Which is pretty remarkable. And then, Probably the more impressive part is players who just guess the first round and lose. It's about 76,000. Okay. And I mean, I'm, I, people who lose in the first round are likely lower ranked. So that's you know, a tremendous amount of money for them to make. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's incredible. There is one thing I did want to bring up that oh. we talked about before we got online and I forgot. Okay. Grunting. Yes. We're talking about, you know, someone like... um Maria Sharapova, who we all may remember, you, her grunt used to be like 105 decibels, which is the equivalent of standing next to an accelerating motorcycle. But as we've talked about, Wimbledon is proper. Mm -hmm. So tell me what the rules are around grunting at Wimbledon. So you're obviously allowed to grunt at men and women. It helps them hit their shots. But you can get called for hindrance, which is a, which is actually going to be a penalty. That's maybe when you're grunting a little too loud and too long after you've hit your shot and it can impact your opponent so there is you're a using it as a, a limit to your grunting powers interesting so you're using it as a tactic basically yes. is what they're saying versus you you're using it to get your shot correct further yes and that's up to the, uh, the umpire to give a call i'm sure it's rarely called only in extreme situations Interesting. See, you learn something new every day here on the Sports Curious Podcast. Things you never thought you even wanted to know and may never want to know again. Endurance. 
hindrance yes. grunting and hindrance yes. well there you have it and that's how we wrap up wimbledon anything else to leave us with before we before we depart that's it that's it that's a wrap thanks rufus for holding down the fort in the air and uh go enjoy wimbledon for more check us out at lastnightsgame.com <laughs>